Okay, I wanted to say hello and welcome to the National Dialogues on Behavioral Health Conference Session 6, Behavioral Health System Issues, Funding, Advocacy, and Education. My name is Jessica Flick, and I'd like to introduce your host and moderator for today, Vijay Ganju, the president of the National Dialogues on Behavioral Health. Vijay, over to you. Thanks, uh, Jessica. Thank you. And thanks, uh, thank you all for joining me for this last, the sixth and final session of the National Dialogues on Behavioral Health Conference for 2021. I think many of you have been uh, participating in the prior sessions, and I think we're again in for a treat. We have uh, three leaders, national leaders in the field, and they'll be providing um, sort of different views of the behavioral health elephant. And I think part of what we hope we end up with is some sense of where we're moving as a field. Um, I think uh, we're very fortunate to have the speakers that are participating with us today. Um, I am going to go through a quick overview. I think many of you have been exposed to it, so I'm not going to belabor it, but I do want to emphasize a couple of points uh, in the, just the terms of the logistics, and then I'll introduce the speakers and turn it over to them. Okay, um, next slide, please. Uh, and so I think uh, I've underlined the fact that the National Dialogues and Behavioral Conference is the oldest behavioral health conference in the United States. This is the 62nd annual conference of the organization. It's usually in New Orleans, and we hope we see you all there in, when we do it in person next year. Um, I think I've underlined the fact that it's 100% voluntary, and it is not only a very informative conference, it's a fun conference, and some people have described it as the gem and the jewel uh, of, uh, among uh, behavioral health conferences across the country. Next slide, please. And so I'm not, I think you have shown you this before, but basically we cover different topics in different years, and this year we have focused on the future but we've uh, focused on things like the criminalization of persons with mental illness, crisis services, how you create value, measure value. So we try to be sort of current and topical and sort of really try to address the issues um, that are meaningful to folks, especially in terms of how to move forward in terms of implementation. Next slide, please. And we also sometimes have uh, sort of very uh, focused uh, pre-conferences where we spend the entire, entire day on a particular topic and sort of, again, have experts uh, pre making presentations. And, and these are uh, sort of very in-depth uh, discussions and uh, information sharing on different topics like artificial intelligence and behavioral health, in terms of uh, resilience and how mindfulness exercise and alternative medicine play a role, uh, school mental health prevention and early intervention are some of the topics that we've had. But we've mostly had these in our in-person conferences. We haven't had anything like the pre-conferences on our virtual platform. Next slide, please. And I want to underline the fact that the product which is the conference is really the result of hard work of a lot of people. And, uh, you know, and it's mostly the work of the National Dialogues and Behavioral Health Executive Committee. And uh, I'm not going to read everybody's name, but many of these uh, folks uh, have been on the committee for many years. And it's really their um, passion and their volunteer work that makes this uh, conference happen. Next slide, please. And we have uh, different organizations that are conference partners, and they include the National Association of County Behavioral Health and Developmental Disability Directors. Ron, who is a presenter, used to be the uh, executive, the chief executive officer of that organization. 
and has been on our uh, executive committee a long time. We have the Western Interstate Commission for Higher Education, WICHI, that's also participated for many years. We have and, and the National Association of Mental Health, State Mental Health Program Directors, and both these organizations are also represented on our executive committee. Next slide, please, Jessica. And uh, we have different uh, sponsors in different years. And this year, again, we have several people that have been uh, sponsors for more than a year, and they really help us uh, sort of uh, deal with some of the expenses that we incur. And this year, much gratitude to all of them. Our sponsors have been Access Health Louisiana, Benchmark Human Services, and Genoa Healthcare. Thanks to all of them. We actually makes this uh, uh, conference possible. Um, I think, again, many of you are used to the idea of how we do q and A's. I, I think uh, these enter your questions uh, in the Q&A box. You can go there and type your question in. I think just want to um, underline the fact that one of our speakers uh, who is not on right now, uh, Dr. Delphin Rittman, will be joining us later and she has a very limited amount of time with us. Uh, and so if you are going to prioritize um, your questions, I would prioritize the questions for her because she may have to leave. CEUs are available, closed captioning is available. And again, please, please, please complete the online evaluation. And now there are a couple of evaluations. One of them is like for the other sessions, there will be a session evaluation. But then later, later on, you will, you will. Get, get, getting, uh, you will also be getting um, evaluation in your email for the conference as a whole. And there are door prizes for that latter conference. Next slide, please. And, you know, I think, as you know, CEUs are available. And if uh, you want those CEUs, please send an email to Melanie Norwood at the email address that's on here. You should have also got this information in uh, letters that you've received. And then at the end of the session, I'll provide a unique code word that you will need to submit with your CEU evaluation, which is different than the other evaluations that I just mentioned. Next slide, please. And okay, this is the URL for the session evaluation. So you can note this down if you want to go or if you have to leave early. Uh, but this will also come up on your screen once the session is over and you can just click on it and it'll take you there right away. Thanks again for being here. What I'm going to do is go right into uh, the introduction to the speakers and then I'll turn it over to them. I'll be introducing and giving you an overview of all the speakers up front. And then I'll turn it over to Neil, who will be the first speaker. So Neil Leibowitz, uh, Dr. Neil Leibowitz, uh, MD, and he has a JD as well, is the Chief Medical Officer for Beacon Health Options. Uh, in this capacity, he oversees Beacon's medical functions and the development of clinical strategies and programs. He is particularly focused on the intersection of digital health and traditional care. Uh, traditional care. Neil, uh, in a past life, was the chief medical officer of Talkspace, where he helped uh, the company enter the enterprise market and grow to over 50 million covered lives, culminating actually in Talkspace becoming the first publicly traded digital behavioral health service company. He has numer numerous other accomplishments and uh, you know, he's held senior roles at Optum at Montefiore uh, Medical College. And so uh, I think that gives you an overview of Neil. And so after Neil does his presentation, he'll be followed by Ron Manderscheid, who many of you know from our previous conferences, Currently, he serves as the adjunct professor at the Bloomberg School of Public Health, Johns Hopkins University, and the Suzanne Dwarak Peck School of Social Work, Social Work at the University of Southern California. 
until recently, as I mentioned before, he was the president CEO of the National Association of County Behavioral Health and Developmental Disability Directors and the National Association for Rural Mental Health. I, I think uh, in some ways I, I could go on and on uh, with Ron's accomplishments. I mean, he was with SAMHSA before that and with the National Institute of Mental Health. And on a personal note, um, he has been our kind of uh, mentor and guide for ever since I've entered the field, which was over 40, 50 years ago. And so uh, he is uh, uh, actually, I think in some ways been uh, sort of like uh, the person who sort of really uh, built up the whole connection with data and policy. I think he was one of the first uh, initiators of a sort of uh, the recovery initiatives and more recently has been pushing uh, priorities related to whole, whole health uh, across the country and whole health and population health. So, uh, you know, I mean, he's got a lot of other accomplishments, but I think uh, many of you know uh, what him personally and what he's done. And then, uh, although she'll be joining us later, we will have uh, Dr. Miriam Delfin Rittman join us. And she is currently the Assistant Secretary for Mental Health and Substance Abuse at SAMHSA. And, uh, you know, she, she is uh, the, uh, 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 I mean, before this position, which is uh, like the lead position at SAMHSA, she served as the Commissioner of the Connecticut uh, Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services and served in that role for six years. Uh, prior to that, she was a deputy commissioner there. And um, before she was at Connecticut, she uh, was an adjunct professor at Yale University where she served on the faculty for the past 20 years. Um, while at Yale, Dr. Delphin Rittman served as the Director of Cultural Competence and Research Consultation with the Yale University Program for Recovery and Community Health. Um, she uh, also uh, completed a two-year White House appointment working as a senior advisor to the administrator of SAMHSA. Uh, and um, at, while at SAMHSA, she worked on a range of policy issues addressing behavioral health equity, workforce development, and healthcare reform. So I think we have a very illustrious, very knowledgeable group of speakers. And so without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Neil Leibowitz. Thank you. Thank you, Vijay. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here and talk to everyone this afternoon. For most of you, maybe morning for a couple of morning for a couple of you. I think we'd all rather be in New Orleans right about now. Um, it's 39 degrees out for me. I definitely want to be in New Orleans. Um, I think Jessica, if you could put the slides up. Great. So I'm going to talk a little bit about behavioral health. First, I'll give a very brief overview just of what I do and a beacon for those who don't know that you know, the sales and marketing piece, but that'll be very brief, but then really dig into some of the things that I've been seeing in the market and that you know, seem to be pretty important and relevant in today's day and age and, and where we're trying to go. So if we move to the next slide, please. So a word about Beacon. Um, and it's, traditionally, there's been a carve out industry in behavioral health, which means that you know, the term is mental health specialist. So companies that really focused on the insurance for mental health, Beacon has been doing this for a really long time. I've been here about approximately six months. So still on the learning curve. Um, it's my second stint in managed care previously with United. Uh, if we move to the next slide, please. And then the other thing just about us is Anthem purchased Beacon about almost two years ago at this point and is in, are in the process of doing a reverse merger, meaning moving all the behavioral health into Beacon, where Beacon becomes the arm for Anthem. As many of you probably know, Anthem is one of the large insurers 
um, from the traditional, for those who have interest in, sorry, my screen popped up. For those of you who have interest in the history of the blues, it, it's actually very fascinating how the blues developed and became how health insurance evolved today back from really the 1900s. Uh, and Anthem is one of those legacies that's evolved over time and become one of the larger insurers. If we move to the next slide. So I don't think I need to harp on this. You know, in, in about 45 seconds, we can all find a bunch of headlines that tell us where we are with behavioral health. And you know, we, we've reached an inflection point in society. COVID was part of it, but we were headed here a long time coming. Um, and what we see in this crisis is it hits on a lot of fronts. There's substance abuse. Suicide has become a big crisis for this country, and we don't really have great answers necessarily for it. So we, and we've had this, and then the other piece, and as a parent, I sort of see this is the world is more stressful. It's, it's harder for my kids than it was for me, and it's probably harder, gonna be harder for their kids in a way. And what was easy growing up doesn't seem so easy. Often as parents, we, we say, well, you know, we did it, you should do it. But I think if we step back or we think about kids, whether we have them or, or relatives or whoever, we think about it in terms of well, what's it like? And the world has gotten more stressful at every age point along the way. And that I think has contributed to some of where we are today. Can you move to the next slide, please. So in terms of anchoring, just a couple of statistics to kind of think about. And people are worried, they're stressed, um, anxiety, depression, other illnesses, post-traumatic stress, everything's been on the rise. And then this point that, that we see with children that we notice it, it's having their, an impact on them and it's hard. And the question really to think about as I run through the next 25 minutes or so are what is the access that we have? Is it enough? And where do we want to go with access? And what does access really mean? And, and that sort of takes us to the future forward thinking portion of what I want to talk about. If we move to the next slide, please. So demand is up. No matter how we measure in behavioral health, there's a need, uh, whether it's in availability of appointments, if it's in how many people are seeking care, if it's in inpatient need, outpatient need. So in a way, what does that mean and how do we interpret it? Is it all good? Is it all bad? How do we take it? So I think that there's a lot of good there. And one of the silver linings of the pandemic is that it really has put a spotlight on mental health. I think it's done in a year or two years at this point to, for stigma and for access, what the prior 10 or 20 years did. So we've really had a focus that pushed the conversation. We see this both from a level of even celebrity endorsement. Um, in, in a way, I saw that Simone Biles signed on with, to be a spokesperson. And what was interesting was it didn't really get the level of coverage that it used to, in part because it's become, in a way, a little bit more destigmatized. Now, when she pulled out of the Olympics, that got a lot of coverage. But I'm saying when she became a sponsor for one of the companies, one of the large provider, digital provider groups, it wasn't as big a deal. And, and that's in a way a nice thing because what it sort of tells us is, is that we're having some destigmatization where celebrities saying that they have a mental illness isn't a shock. It isn't something that is, you know, it's bold, but it doesn't reach the level that it did several years ago when the early 
celebrities and athletes came out and said, I have mental illness. Like that was a shock to people that it was starting to enter the conversation. And now while it hasn't normalized, we're starting to get there. So there is good with you. Know? And then what that represents to me are that there is some decreasing stigma because otherwise people wouldn't access care. So that becomes one piece. As we talk about solutions, I think the solutions that have emerged in the different levels of access, also positives. So what's the bad and the ugly in terms of people seeking care? To me, it's a couple of things. One is, are we able to meet the supply? So that's the number one thing. So if in a lot of ways, the medical industry has created a product and then found people to get it. That's sort of the drug company model. We found the drug, then go find an illness and market it sometimes, right? We expand that box. That's what a lot of institutional medicine has done. And others can sort of argue that that's controversial, but ultimately there's some of that. Here, the demand came, and while there was some supply, there isn't enough. And some of that is geographic. Some of it is just overwhelming of providers. And it's a problem. If you're depressed and you need medication, waiting six to eight weeks for a psychiatrist is a long time. If you're playing basketball and you fall on your knee and you hurt it significantly, you're probably not waiting six to eight weeks to go see an orthopedist. If you have a burn, you're probably not waiting six to eight weeks to go see a dermatologist. So we're getting better. There are ways to get quicker access, but we still have an access problem. The second problem is, is with innovation is how do we evaluate the innovation? And how do we ensure that there's enough guardrails around some of the innovation? And as someone who's worked in tech and is very pro-innovation, what I wanna make sure of, and what I wanna feel comfortable is, is what's someone doing with my data? And is this solution or, or care that I'm seeking really as efficacious as someone would claim? And you know, if we start doing Google searches in mental health and look at the paid advertisements, there are a lot. A couple of years ago, there weren't many, there may have been none. So the marketing piece makes it a little tricky and how do you market healthcare and how as you as a consumer do you understand the ecosystem to me becomes a question. Next slide, please. So you know, words about some of the things that we've been working on that, that we find really interesting has been crisis. So with the pandemic, we've seen a focus on crisis from the federal level, from the state level, from the community level. There's more of an emphasis on what can we do for people in crisis. Now, I remember several years ago when the crisis text line became known or a thing, and it was revolutionary. And that was really the first change in what people should do in crisis if they were having a behavioral health issue. And it was a nonprofit started really off an idea by an innovator. And it led to real change where now people sitting in their room alone or feeling depressed at three in the morning could actually get on their phone, text and get a counselor or a volunteer and get immediate help. And that was fantastic. But the truth is it wasn't enough. And now we're starting to see a lot of focus on what do we do with people in crisis? How are we gonna help them? If we move to the next slide. So, you know, that piece is a piece for access and in Beacon, we focused on building that out and adding that to accounts and looking for opportunities to help people in crisis. What's the next piece? Next piece is if we took all the people who wanted behavioral health help and we took all the licensed clinicians and lined them up, there's a mismatch. We know that. And part of it is education, part of it is licensing. Part of it is a mismatch between where the people are with the licenses and where the people are seeking the care. 
So telehealth does solve some of that. Um, I'll talk a little bit later about how legislature can start to solve that. But I also wanna talk about this concept of what is care and what should care be going forward? And you know, someone said this to me a while ago and it kind of stuck with me and, and I don't mean it to sound pejorative is some people seek a therapist when they should be seeking a friend. And, and it hit home. And I remember several years ago, I ended up giving a conversation, a talk at a fraternity conference, a national fraternity conference, very weird. Someone asked me and somehow I ended up there. I wasn't even in a fraternity in college. So going, and I remember actually, it came back to me that one of the things I had said that probably went over pretty poorly was, and it was about mental health and access was, you have resources around you. And that might be your fraternity brother, might be your parents, not so bad if you're in college, go call your parents. Maybe that was self-serving at the time with kids. And the notion is, well, what is care? And I think we're starting to redefine that. So I'll let you sort of peruse on, on your own sort of what we've done or what the focus is, but one way to focus on it is, is, is redefining that. And that's a place, for example, I just use peer specialists as an example of somewhere where we can provide a lot of help to people, lighten up the burden on the licensed folk who have a lot of burnout and there aren't enough and provide people with the level of care that they need. Let's move to the next slide, please. Uh, and, and just another example of, you know, and substance abuse is really a wonderful place where using different groups, different groups of people with different life experiences can help with engagement and access. And the engagement piece is really important. Um, when I was training, we told people how to consume mental health. Uh, as a psychiatrist, we told them, you know, come to my office 930, we're going to do an evaluation, you'll, I'll probably give you a prescription and go fill it at the pharmacy down the street and you'll come back next month at 11. And that was care. I'm oversimplifying, that was care. And then we wondered why the modal number, the most common number of visits that people who sought mental health treatment was, was one. And in part because we were really defining who care was with and what care was. And by allowing for different people and different treatments, I think that modal number is gonna head down, I don't know how far down of one, and maybe it won't be one for much longer, maybe it'll be two or maybe hopefully six or seven at least, where people can get what they need, which in many cases, isn't just outcomes. You know, early in my career, I just wanted to see outcomes when I started moving into supervisory roles. And there's this concept of NPS. I'm sure you've heard of what NPS is. But companies like Apple and Starbucks, that's what they focus on, consumer satisfaction. In healthcare, we were focused on outcomes. We still need to focus on outcomes. We can't get rid of that. And I think it's critical. But we also need to focus on NPS. And to me, the way I think about NPS, which is called Net Promoter Score, how people evaluate their experience with the business, is we want to focus on it from the terms of if people come in, and whether it's they come into my office and it's dirty and they don't come back, they come in, they feel someone was rude to them, maybe it was a receptionist or maybe it was a doctor, or they go on a virtual visit and they feel that the person's distracted, they're not paying attention to the screen. All those things provide what I would call a subpar experience. And a subpar experience leads to people not returning. It doesn't even necessarily lead to a bad outcome. They fall out of the sample. They're not even in the outcome sample because they haven't been in treatment long enough to evaluate how they've done. And this is where sometimes a peer is the right person. The experience isn't just the office. It's who you interact with, their ability to communicate with you. Sometimes it's the level of treatment and the complexity. Right? If you come to a psychiatrist, for the most part, you're gonna get a complexity that's focused on getting medication. A lot of people don't want medication. Most people don't need medication. 
You go to an orthopedist, the likelihood of getting operated on is higher. If you go to a psychiatrist, the likelihood of getting medication is higher. Not that we're trying to necessarily force people to have it, but that should be a sort of how the training goes and how those brain muscles work. So having the ability to expand that box is going to become more and more important and more interesting as we move along. Next slide, please. So if we were live, I'd ask people what 90791 is. And I guess I'll just tell you, it's a code. It's an initial evaluation code. And the point here is to say that when you have a one-stop shop, meaning you're either in the system or out of the system, you're either getting care or not. And care is defined by seeing a licensed professional. That's not how we're going to solve people's problems and not how we're going to solve the mental health crisis. Okay? It's, it's not a entry point. And if we think about care as wellness in a continuum, that begins to help us understand how we solve this, which is different people need different levels of things. The truth is we want to save those 90791s, initial evaluations with a therapist or or with a psychiatrist, slightly different code. We want to save those for the people who need it or really want it. And I'll, I'll put want in quotes. We want to offer other solutions for people who don't. You know, at the end of the day, if we think about mental health treatment globally, my, you know, one of my daughters doesn't sleep. She says she can't go to sleep. She found calm in the app. She listens some nights, helps her sleep mental health treatment in my mind, and it's serving what she needs. And if I felt that a therapist was what she needed, well, that would be great too, and we'd get her there, but this serves it. And in my mind, it's mental health treatment. It's not how most people may think about it, but I think this is how we want to start thinking about it. And this is a continuum. Next slide, please. So what's the problem with all this? What's the state of care? this, which is, it's getting hard for anyone who, for a lay person, and even experts to evaluate what's going on in the market. We have digital therapeutics, things that are prescribed. How do those work? Who are they for? Do they really work? Is this a real FDA process and not so real FDA process? You know, all the way down to, well, this company is promoting peers. Is that real. I saw one company that was promoting listeners. I'm not totally sure what that is, to be quite honest, but is that a thing, as one of my kids would tell me? Uh, is text therapy, what my old company did, or messaging therapy, is that efficacious? Is my data protected? Should I use any of these things? Is something like Headspace or Happify, are those real healthcare? Do they, does HIPAA apply? Can they share my data? What rules are they governed by? So the problem is, is that we've had this innovation, an insane amount of funding going to innovation. And with that, it's confusing. And it's my day job understanding this, and I'm confused sometimes. So it's confusing. So think about the person seeking care, how to, how do they navigate this thing? It's very challenging. Next slide, please. So let's talk a little bit about access. And when we think about access, I want to define it a little bit and run through very quickly what I think it is. So official telehealth, that's you and I on a Zoom. It's just HIPAA compliant. Obviously, bricks and mortar is, would be above this. I didn't think I needed to put that in. Text and chat, both live and non-live. So live would be a schedule an appointment with a licensed provider, it could be unlicensed for a case, but you schedule it and you show up, but you're not on video, right? you're chatting. And there were people when, when I was with Talkspace who said, oh, that's not therapy. Um, you know, before the telephone, people communicated by letters and that worked pretty well. And if you read some history in some of the old letters, they're pretty rich and they paint a pretty good picture. Or if you read novels, or, those type of things. Um, obviously, I'm a believer. I spent a lot of time 
looking at that data and research. Then there's asynchronous. It goes back to that modal number of sessions, which is maybe I don't want a session. Maybe I want to have the ability to have someone who can communicate with me daily, asynchronously or asynchronously. Microtherapy, as some people call it. I want small bite-sized therapy where maybe I am just not comfortable having an appointment. So that becomes sort of the next level where it's a one-on-one -on -one relationship, but it's not the traditional video or even telephonic. Then we move to self-service. Self-service is when you go on a computer and in some way, whether it's an app or, or a PC or through the web and are receiving some sort of service. Uh, mindful CBT has been around in modular form for decades and decades. It hasn't sort of become spoken about until more recently. It's been around a long time. Uh, the discontinuation is high, but for people who are committed, they do very, very well. And it's not for everyone. And I don't believe that we need a fail first strategy. You must use a computer before you have a live person, but I believe it should be in part of our offering. And then, you know, I'll quickly do this care navigation is trying to help people understand what's available to them and what the offerings are and what might be appropriate for them. That's becoming a helpful thing in promoting access. And that could be you go and fill out a questionnaire of sorts or some information and some recommendations. Maybe the recommendation is you should go see a psychiatrist. Maybe the recommendation is, hey, here's that call map that might be helpful for you. So helping people navigate this blurry, blurry ecosystem. Um, devices, drugs, passive captures here more for completeness. Um, I'm not super bullish on it, so I don't want to spend a lot of time on it. And then finally, I used to have people come to my office, especially earlier in my career where I did a lot of inpatient work and, and a lot of work and people who economically disadvantaged is if someone comes to your office and they're depressed, but they're really depressed because they can't put food on their table for themselves and their family. The medication isn't the solution. And in time, we're, we're getting there. We're making progress. Even as an insurance company, we have some states, we have a limited number of housing beds that we can use for people we serve. Because it's not always about giving more prescriptions or more therapy or more treatment. And I think social determinants become part of the care ecosystem. We're not fully mature as a society. I would love to see codes where we can code for these things and they can become reimbursable. But for now, you know, at least at Beacon and Anthem, we're trying to build this out because it's both the right thing to do. And the truth is, look, this is a public company. Is it somewhat cost effective? Next slide, please. State of quality I, is really what I would say. The session is still a black box. We haven't figured out what really goes on to the level. We can't just take a hemoglobin A1C or a blood test like we do in diabetes and other illnesses. We've tried to standardize and some of that's questionnaires and we haven't been that good. So the state of quality is really not where it should be. We are behind in what is, it. and we're behind not only medicine, consumer companies have more information about their clients than in a way we do about the quality of care and behavioral health that we get. So hopefully in the dialogue, I'll have a little more time and we can chat a bit about this, but it's not where we wanna go. What is interesting is instead of making people fill out surveys, and to be honest, I don't fill out surveys. When I fly, I get one question from my airline, how is our service? And I usually just delete it. That's probably what most of you do. So the truth is it's not about active capture. It becomes about passive capture. And this is where data analytics, machine learning, and AI, I'm hesitant to say, because it, it means different things to different people, can really be a game changer in terms of how we evaluate quality and know that what we're getting out of our clinicians and out of the behavioral health system is worth anything. The next slide, please. Second to last slide, I believe, which is the government. 
where does the government fit in? And the things I want to highlight quickly here are that we work on a code system. And it probably isn't the right system for the care we want. Codes drive peace goods, it drives utilization, but it doesn't drive outcomes. And it also drives inequity and inequality. Interestingly, on the commercial, so if you're employed, you have EAP, which is becoming a wellness product. Or in your behavioral benefit, I can give you whatever I think is efficacious. If I want calm to be part of your benefit, we can make calm part of your benefit, headspace, whatever it is. In the entitlement space, we're not allowed to use codes that way. And it's trickier to add benefits, just the structure without going into a long diatribe. So the code system is not prepared. We need to figure this out. There are different paths we can go, whether it's enhance what's allowable codes in the entitlement space or allow for non-coded type care. But we need to move more away from codes. And that's when the dream of a value-based system or all those sort of buzzwords we hear become valuable. The way we license providers at the state level, it doesn't really work. My office is in New York and someone comes over from New Jersey five minutes away over the bridge. They can see me. I can't see them on telehealth without a New Jersey license doesn't make any sense. And then finally grants. Our grant process is a bit antiquated the way I see it, which is getting grants is very hard. They tend to be larger. We wanna do more micro grants for early stage companies as a proof of concept and piggyback on it to see what's real as opposed to giving companies a license to market off their own internal white papers and data. The next slide please. I think I've touched on a bit what the future holds throughout my talk, but to me, where we go is we're going to see changes in the definition of what treatment is and a shift away from medical necessity to one of wellness. And the wellness continuum is going to include things that traditionally haven't been thought of services and treatments that maybe didn't exist. The goal is to have the quality portion catch up. So we really know if those treatments and ways that we're promoting access provide any value, and by value in this case, I mean good service and good outcomes. And that's really the question is, how is that gonna evolve and how long will it take? So thank you. And let me turn it over to the next speaker, to Ron, I believe. Okay, so I guess first I want to congratulate VJ and the National Dialogues team on reaching number 62. That is quite an accomplishment that anything in behavioral health would ever last that long. So congrats to VJ and the whole group. I'm going to go quickly through my presentation. I have about 15 minutes here. And I'll highlight some things and play other things down, but the whole uh, PowerPoint will be available for you to see it. I want to bring Amanda Gorman in. Amanda Gorman is the Youth uh, Poet Laureate of the United States. This is what she said at the inauguration. The major point here is that we have to ourselves be the light of the future. It isn't the government. It isn't the private sector. It isn't the 501c3. It's us. And she was very courageous to actually say that. And I think that's kind of where we are in behavioral health these days. So also bring you greetings and best wishes from the American Academy of Social Work and Social Welfare that works on the same kinds of issues that you're working on here in the National Dialogues. Um, jump over that. So a lot of this in my initial set of PowerPoints here, you know, and I'm just gonna skip over it very rapidly. If you look at classical epidemiology, 25% of adults and 20% of children have a diagnosable mental health condition in a year. About 6% of adults and nine to 13% of adolescents have serious and persistent mental conditions. And it's that latter group that's cared for mainly by uh, Places like SAMHSA, the State Departments of Mental Health, now State Departments of Behavioral Health, and so on. 
some uh, additional digging in here. I think the highlight on this one is drug overdose deaths exceeded 93,000 per year in 2020. That's 20,000 higher than it was the year before and the highest it's ever been, partly attributable to COVID and the effects of COVID. Uh, in Neil's comments, almost 50,000 persons die by suicide each year, and I'll show you some interesting factoids on that in a minute. Behavioral health care can't meet the current demand. Um, only about 20% of adults receive care from a behavioral health provider. Among those who seek care, 80% receive care from a primary care provider. That number has gone up about 30% in the last 10 to 15 years. So a lesser and lesser proportion of all behavioral health care provided is provided by behavioral health providers. A larger and larger proportion is provided by others, primarily uh, primary care physicians. Need to make a bullet and a point here on many people who do not receive care are incarcerated in our city and county jails. So tonight there'll be 730,000 people in the city and county jails. 80 to 90% of those people will be people with a primary behavioral health condition. We have a, a human resource crisis. We can talk about that in the discussion section. We've been talking about that in the field for 20 years. When we first talked about it, it was a problem. Now it's a crisis. Much more reliance is being placed on peer supporters, virtual care and self-care. Behavioral care has been very slow to adopt integrated care approaches, which would help the field better deliver behavioral health services. Now I wanna shift into COVID, times really have changed. COVID, this is, I'm giving you some data from uh, CDC. And so in the classical epidemiology, as I showed you before, and that's classical for 40 years, the numbers I showed you have been true, 25% of adults, 20% of children. If you go now and look at what happened in COVID, that 25% became 41%, and a more recent survey shows as high as 50% or doubling, our behavioral health issues doubled in the COVID period. What are some of the major areas here? 41% had at least one mental or behavioral consequence, 31% anxiety or depression, 26% trauma or stress, 13% increased substance abuse, 11% <clears throat> contemplated suicide. That's an incredible number. 11% of the population, adult population contemplated suicide. And then these latter three statistics, I'm gonna dwell on a second. 33% of unpaid caregivers contemplated suicide. Incredible number. 25% of those, <clears throat> excuse me, 18 to 24 contemplated suicide. 22% of essential health workers contemplated suicide. So these rates climbed up to about 50% and since January of 2021 and are now uh, slightly receding here. Thus we are in what I would call a behavioral health pandemic. Behavioral health care has also changed. Uh, you know many of these things, Neil mentioned many of them. Uh, in one month, April 2020, behavioral health transitioned almost completely from interpersonal to virtual care. We did in a month what typically in our processes would take three to five years. And it's led to important learning. Some people do actually much, much better with virtual care than they did with interpersonal care, in my opinion, because it's much more equalitarian between the provider and the consumer. Behavioral health care has had great difficulty acquiring uh, personal protective equipment uh, because many of our providers weren't defined as essential health providers. They couldn't get personal protective equipment. Do you wanna go into a hospital and work in a hospital without personal protective equipment if you're working with people who have COVID? And of course the answer is no. So in many areas that problem has been solved. If it has not been solved in your area, you need to work on it before the next crisis occurs. <clears throat> Mental hospitals and local jails deinstitutionalized rapidly in the late spring of 2020. And they did this simply by closing the front doors, opening the back doors, and that led to problems in local communities because we had a huge influx of people who we weren't prepared for and who really had no service plan, they had no care coordinator and so on. <clears throat> we worked with SAMHSA on that issue and they worked with some of the other federal entities to try to limit the effects of that. 
I don't believe that that was totally effective at the time that that occurred. Revenue behavioral health care organizations fell 40 to 50 percent in 2020, mid 2020, and now has mainly recovered. I would say for many entities, many provider entities, it's back up to 90 to 95 percent of what it was before. Important gains were made in expanding virtual behavioral health care. Uh, the issue here is we absolutely have to need do policy work and advocacy that the, so that these things are extended beyond and uh, federal Medicaid and Medicare allow the use of virtual behavioral health care going forward, including, including telephonic care. It's very, very important. Shortfall here, the field itself estimated that there was a shortfall in behavioral health care of about $38 billion. There also was a bigger shortfall across all services in states of about 500 billion and in counties of 150 billion, total of 650 billion. About half of this was included in the American Rescue Plan. 300 billion for states, 69 billion for counties. You need to find out how much of that 300 billion and 69 billion for counties is going into behavioral health care. Very important question. You should ask that of your county. You should ask that of your state, basically. Future of behavioral health care is uncertain at present. What can be done? The current crisis in behavioral health care can be partially mitigated through the implementation of population behavioral care. Don't have time to go into great detail on this, uh, but would be happy to talk more in the Q&A period. Prevention is always preferred over treatment. I say again, prevention is always preferred over treatment. If you get into population behavioral care, you can get into prevention. First thing. Second, integrated care, very important. We need to move on this. And third, value-based purchasing. So those are the three things I want to spend just a few minutes uh, on here going forward. So population behavioral care. Low coming only slowly population behavioral care now is seen as a critical to the future of behavioral health care field, including crisis care. And I want to also extend this to say, if you think about this, you say population behavioral care, if I can understand the social and physical determinants of health that influence particular subsets of the population, I can do things to prevent downstream problems in behavioral health. I can also do things to prevent downstream problems in areas such as racism. We can talk more about that. The underlying model, negative social and physical determinants of health lead to personal and family trauma, lead to health and behavioral health consequences, lead to need for care and support. We now believe 85% of behavioral health care is due to personal or familial trauma. Got it right here. Good example, adverse childhood experiences. You all know the adverse childhood experience scale. Child experiences up to six adverse childhood experiences. The probability is almost 100% that by the time that child gets to be age 18, they will have a behavioral health condition. But how do we address this? We absolutely have to get into trauma-informed care and trauma-informed recovery, basically. Now recognize that persons in behavioral care field also will need training in public health and community interventions. Joint degrees are becoming more common. My, both at Hopkins and at USC, I have students coming to me saying, how can I get a joint degree between social work, MSW, and public health, MPH, or verse if I'm at Hopkins, MPH and MSW. And if you're true and honest about it, there aren't many interprofessional programs, but there will be many more going forward here, basically. We can use population behavioral care strategies to prevent and reduce the behavioral health and social effects of COVID-19 and its mitigation efforts. We'll talk more about that in the discussion period. We can use population behavioral care strategies to prevent and reduce personal behavioral health crises that occur in the community. And I've talked many, many times about that. Some of you have heard me talk about that. Moving toward integrated care, the Affordable Care Act set the stage for person-centered care and integrated care service delivery. Behavioral care has been slow to adopt these practices. The comprehensive community behavioral health clinics do this very important. We need to build that system up even more. And virtual care delivery has helped us 
move toward integrated care because it's reduced the problem from being a huge bureaucratic change problem to one where you can simply put a computer on a desk and you can bring either the primary care provider or the behavioral health provider literally on, or the peer support specialist right onto the desk here. Integrated care likely will expand to incorporate social services. Healthcare will continue to adopt integrated care at an accelerating rate. And the number of comprehensive community behavioral health clinics will continue to grow much like the original community mental health center program. Moving very slowly toward value-based purchasing. Although the Trump administration basically suspended work on value-based purchasing, it's back on track again now, and the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services have resumed work on this. <clears throat> the goal first is to bring Medicare under a value-based purchasing model and then to extend the work to Medicaid. What value-based purchasing ultimately means is that providers would be paid on a, a, pre, a per capita population basis and that that per capita population basis would be adjusted by the types of outcomes that those providers are achieving. Uh, many healthcare entities are developing value-based purchasing strategies and capacities currently. Many fewer behavioral healthcare entities are doing so. That is very problematic. <clears throat> Excuse me. Going ahead here. Next steps for value-based purchasing. It seems likely that managed care entities will continue to adopt value-based purchasing protocols for behavioral health care provider entities. The clear implication is that behavioral health care entities will need to develop data capacity to compute accurate population capitation rates and to store, analyze, and maintain outcome and performance information. We'll talk more about that in the Q&A period as well. National leadership and technical assistance will be needed to facilitate these transitions. I'm hoping that uh, uh, Miriam, when she talks in a couple minutes, will be offering that technical assistance from SAMHSA. So we can put it all together. So you put it all together here, community level prevention through addressing the social and physical determinants of health and community level population behavioral care can reduce behavioral health crises and target care needs more accurately than is currently the case. Right now, we use pretty much a shotgun approach to all of this. Expansion of integrated care can reduce care delivery crises facing behavioral health care, can reduce some of our staffing problems and so on. We need to do much more in that area. And finally, expansion of value-based purchasing to align behavioral health care with health care delivery practices is a critical step for our future. I do commentaries on all these things. You can get my commentaries at Behavioral Health Care Executive at www.behavioralhealth.net. And here is my contact information. And I'm completing exactly at 3 o'clock, VJ. I um, appreciate that. I, uh, I'm going to see if uh, I think we're still waiting on. Um, um, we're still waiting on Dr. Uh, uh, Delphin Rittman. Um, and so while we're waiting, you know, I just want to, uh, and this might be a transition into her presentation. I think both of them have been very uh, sort of provocative presentations, but the picture is dire. Um, and so, uh, you know, as you look at it, the whole purpose of this was that the things that are going to shape the future is not just the kinds of treatments and the workforce that is available, but basically it's the funding, it's the public education and the advocacy that one's able to do, especially when sort of resources seem to be nosediving uh, and uh, disappearing. And so uh, at this stage, you know, I, I think the challenge is that if you look at it from the behavioral health perspective, behavioral health is a small part of health. And yet what is shaping a lot of this are the social determinants. And so, you know, I, I know we talk about prevention and population based, but it seems to me that the needs that the behavioral health system has are really sort of impacted by 
not only the larger health system, but almost the larger social system. So it's almost like, given the constraints that we are operating under, how can behavioral health bring about the changes that it needs? It seems to me we're always in a crisis mode. So, you know, you all might want to reflect on this while we try to see what's happening with uh, Miriam and her ability. To I'm glad you're giving us a couple of minutes, VJ, to think about this. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, no, I, I, I think as you think about this, you know, it's almost like I've seen other areas of health how advocates and so on have actually made quite a big impact for their uh, kind of uh, uh, the problem or the issue that they're trying to deal with. And I think we've got the prevalence, we've got the recognition, we've reduced stigma. So what is needed next to essentially push the uh, envelope in a way, you know? Well, so just make, to give a couple of quick responses here that occur to me and I encourage Neil to do so also. So I think um, one of the things that's changed, and Neil alluded to this in his talk, is the fact that mental health is now on the radar. It's on the radar at every level. It's on the radar at, in the Congress. It's on the radar in the White House. It's on the radar in state houses. It's in the, on the radar in county boards. We need to step in and tell them what we want. We are never very clear about then following up and say, what do we need to do in order to do this? And partly our problem is we don't speak with a single voice. Uh, I worked with the disciplines for years and the disciplines don't speak with a single voice. One discipline will go on the hill and say, well, you know, psychiatry is the best, you know, you should fund psychiatrists to do X. And the social workers will go and say, you should fund social workers to do Y. They don't work together as a group. And because of that, and that's been true for years and years and years, the Hill says, who speaks for the field? They say, no one speaks for the field. Therefore, that stymies a lot of action on the Hill. For example, right now, there are two senators trying to craft a bill for the future of mental health. We should be helping them to craft it. We should be having a common message to do this, yet we don't, basically. So I think part of our problem here, to go to back to what you said, VJ, is the fact that we ourselves don't play the game in a way that allows us to be effective. We're too disparate in all of our views here as one issue. I'm going to piggyback on that. And, he, and, and take it a little bit further to say that the field within the field don't even agree or do a very good job of advocating for themselves. And, and what I mean by that is, is that you know, innovation is happening. Whether we like it or not, it's happening and it's being driven by a corporate structure that's doing it. And resisting it, instead of taking a seat at the table, hurts your own cause. And what I've found is that, you know, to be very honest, I gave up my, my memberships and professional associations. There's probably someone on here who's gonna reach out after and give me a hard time. In part because of that, because I felt like it was too much resistance of the change that's coming rather than saying, well, we wanna make sure it's done thoughtful and not really protect what we have, which isn't really working. And that, that's been my take. I spent a lot of time during the pandemic, actually like with my prior company, talking with congressmen, with senators, with their aides and educating them. And there wasn't a lot of knowledge and understanding of what the real problems for the people and not even like the big tech companies. I'm talking about the provider <laughs> group who's down the street from me, the sole practitioner or two person group, like what is their life really like and what are their barriers? And they have been taught, spoken to by all the big groups. And I felt that there was really very little understanding of what the people who actually are doing this work every day need and want and I, I personally would want to seat at the table 
and I think we can do a better job. And, and then unifying among the groups, there's more commonality than we think, yet we don't do that. Yeah. There's Miriam. Okay. Um, okay. I think we're just um, waiting to see if uh, she is uh, um, going to be able to join us. Yeah. And she's on. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks a lot. I'm sorry if there was any kind of technical confusion, but we've been uh, discussing the sort of, uh, in some ways, hopeful but bleak future. And so everybody's been waiting for you, Dr. Delphin Rittman. Oh. You are going to be solving all the problems. <laughs> no. oh, well, we will definitely solve it together. You know, I was on, I guess I was in webinar mode. So I was able to hear the last part of the conversation. And so appreciate okay. that I was able to, to listen in on that. I, I've told everyone that you have very limited time. So we'll let you do your presentation and then we'll let both the panelists and the attendees ask you questions before you have to leave. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. And, and you know, I just have to say, I, I so appreciate the invitation and, and being able to, to sort of uh, be part of this important conversation and discussion. I'm actually going to go through my slides quickly so we can have uh, time for discussion. So I may even skip a few. Um, and I believe they were going to be, I believe you all have those and are going to project those for me. Perfect. Um, and again, just, you know, thank you for the invitation to, to be here. Um, so why don't we just go, go right to the next slide? So, you know, so what I'm going to talk about real briefly is, you know, I'll talk about SAMHSA priorities and cross-cutting principles. Uh, we'll talk about the changing landscape of behavioral health and sort of was asked to do some forecasting there in terms of sort of moving forward and what the behavioral health field is looking like. That's always a challenge, um, especially now as things are so challenge uh, changeable. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the ways in which SAMHSA is prioritizing using data to inform policies, programs, and um, and thinking about our direction and, and policy vision. Um, and then also we'll talk about some of our work related to uh, behavioral health equity. Uh, so next slide, please. You know, I wanted to start by just sharing some about, uh, you know, the key priorities that we are looking at and, and advancing as SAMHSA. Um, when I came on board, I felt it was so important to, to sort of look at our work and ensure that uh, our priority areas, and I felt it was important to develop cross-cutting principles as well, um, that it just aligns with this unique and challenging moment uh, that we're in, in terms of behavioral health for the country. And so um, our key priorities, and these are not in order of importance, uh, are you know, preventing overdose. We know that's critical as we've seen the overdoses unfortunately continue to rise. Um, enhancing access to suicide prevention and crisis care, another really important area of work. Um, as increasingly we've heard that the, the last, we know, 18, 19 months, uh, we're seeing increased rates of stress and anxiety. And so ensuring that people have access to um, suicide prevention and crisis uh, services and supports. The key work there will be the work around 988, and I'll talk about that a little bit more in, in a bit. Um, also promoting children and youth behavioral health, we know is a critical area. Um, integrating our primary care and behavioral health. And, and so that is a long time SAMHSA priority and certainly one that we're working to continue to take uh, you know, to new heights and new levels. Um, and then using performance data uh, measures uh, and evaluation to really look at our work and, and to, to do sort of meaningful assessment and evaluation of our work to see what we wanna um, maybe scale up or scale back or, or just how our, our various uh, funding initiatives um, are meeting the intended goals or not. Um, and then in terms of cross-cutting principles, equity, you know, equity is, is so critical, especially now um, as we're seeing, you know, increased uh, disparities across healthcare as a function of COVID, but, you know, disparities and, and uh, inequities uh, in some instances, in many instances that were there prior to COVID. And so this, we see this as cross-cutting and undergirding all the work at, we do at SAMHSA, also workforce. Um, financing and uh, recovery. And I'll talk more about those areas uh, in a little bit. Um, next slide, please. Um, so again, in terms of, you know, thinking about the future and, and how we might um, forecast looking forward, I, I think in many ways, the future um, for behavioral health is, is, can be envisioned in some ways in the present, in the present moment. Um, the present moment has identified and, and certainly illuminated a number of priority areas, I think, as a nation um, that, that, you know, we're currently focused on and, and 
um, we'll need to continue to be focused on uh, in, until we're able to see some of the areas appropriately mitigated. Um, again, we know the pandemic uh, has, has really forced us to think about uh, new and creative ways of being able to deliver care rapidly to connect people to services and supports. Um, we know that, you know, for example, telehealth, um, you know, providers have had to very quickly stand up uh, telehealth strategies to be able to ensure that people are connected to services and supports and, uh, and also sort of keep safe, you know, during different times when we've had to um, have various levels of, of being, you know, less in circulation. Um, in, in terms of, uh, you know, the uh, overdose crisis, you know, SAMHSA, we, we put in a number of flexibilities in response, uh, you know, to the current climate and current needs related to the public health emergency uh, to include uh, flexibilities around methadone uh, take-home doses and um, been a lot of advocacy there around continuing many of those. And, you know, that's just one example. We'll, we'll talk about some of those uh, areas as well. Um, next slide, please. Um, and, and then, of course, last week, you know, the secretary announced and uh, the overdose prevention strategy. Um, this has been just an area of, of such cross-cutting collaboration across the department. Um, but again, collaboration geared towards sort of meeting um, and addressing where we are and what we're seeing related to increased, uh, you know, unfortunately, overdose rates. Um, the, the four sort of main pillars of this uh, strategy, if you will, include primary prevention, uh, uh, harm reduction. Um, evidence-based treatment and recovery supports. Um, I think the two areas that are that are real innovations and that we're real excited about are just you know thinking about um, ways to continue to address harm reduction and, and to put harm reduction approaches and strategies in place. Um, and then also recovery supports. I mean, each of these areas are across HHS um, areas that we're working on to, to uh, bring overdose rates down. Um, and we'll talk about some of this work in, in uh, a few slides coming up. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so one area, you know, of course, that, that is part of this and central to it uh, is increasing access to medication-assisted treatment. Um, we know that's an evidence-based intervention. Um, we know that uh, research and some of the research from our funding programs uh, themselves show that when people are connected to services and supports, we do see improved health outcomes. Um, so for example, for our MAP-PIDOA grant, um, so this is a grant that's geared towards increasing uh, access to medication-assisted treatment, whether it be methadone, um, buprenorphine, naltrexone, uh, for people struggling with opioid use disorder. Um, what we have found with this, with this grant is a 63% uh, reduction uh, in the use of opiates and also uh, a 64% uh, cessation in alcohol or, or use of other illicit drugs um, as six-month follow-up. Uh, for individuals that were participating in this in this uh, um, program, um, in FY21 we awarded an additional 127 grants for a total of seven, 71.3 million. So uh, definitely an area of, of priority in terms of sort of where we are now, but it, you know forecasting looking forward uh, in terms of increasing access to medication assisted treatment. Um, next slide, please. Um, and I spoke about this a little bit earlier. So, so you know, uh, key areas of work for the department immediately, uh, you know, once the uh, public health emergency was declared was, you know, increasing access to uh, methadone. Um, so there are flexibilities that were put in place there around take-home doses. Um, we are looking to continue to uh, make those more permanent over time. And so that work is underway. Um, there are also flexibilities put in place around uh, prescribers being able to administer buprenorphine without an in-person exam. Uh, and so that is uh, an area uh, also that's, that's been uh, well-received and a lot of advocacy around continuing. So we are committed to, to taking the areas and taking what we've learned from the pandemic and, and finding ways to continue to maintain those things that are working. Um, next slide, please. One other thing that, that we did is we, uh, you know, for prescribers interested in prescribing to uh, up to 30 individuals, uh, took down the, the need for the in-person exam and some of the other, or for the exam, uh, and then other certifications. Uh, so, so again, this is for individuals, uh, prescribers, prescribing up to 30 people. Um, and we've seen that, that just off of this alone, uh, we have over, uh, you know, 6,000 new prescribers. Uh, who are, uh, you know, who are prescribing uh, buprenorphine 
in total, about 3,000 off of this particular waiver and, and uh, 6,000 overall. Um, next slide, please. You know, so another area of work in terms of, um, you know, where we are now, but also looking forward is implementation of our 988 crisis line. Um, we see this as just such a, a major system transformation in terms of how crisis care uh, and suicide prevention is, is approached. Um, we know the need is there, you know, the data unfortunately, um, you know, uh, highlights that. Um, our new NISDA data in fact show that in 2020, about 4.9% of adults age 18 or older, so again, about 4.9% 4, 4 of adults 18 or older or 12.2 million Americans had serious thoughts of suicide. Um, and so the goal of 988, and, and again, this will be a crisis line uh, and suicide prevention uh, you know, line and support where people can call um, and uh, you know, if necessary, be triaged and outreach workers will connect with them and, and they will potentially be uh, connected to uh, other services and supports that may be necessary. Uh, the piece that we're focusing on now and that goes live July uh, 2022 is standing up the line. Uh, the crisis line. So we're, we're um, excited about that. That essentially will be a, a, the uh, transferring the current suicide prevention lifeline to the three digit 988 number. Um, and we anticipate that, you know, the call volume will increase. Uh, this will be able to accommodate both calls, texts, and chats. So, so we're thinking about in terms of the implementation, a uh, significant increase in volume um, and anticipate that it could help to reduce uh, suicides help to increase engagement in services and supports, um, and can help to reduce uh, connections, unnecessary connections with law enforcement, um, which, which can be helpful for folks. Um, next slide, please. I'm gonna go through these quickly so we can do have time for, for discussion. Um, another area is our uh, certified community behavioral health clinics. And so, you know, we know that for far too long, um, you know, services can be fragmented. And so a, a goal here, was to be able to create, uh, if, if you will, uh, wraparound services and supports through one stop uh, by community behavioral health clinics. Uh, they, there's a range of required services that they have to offer. So crisis services, treatment planning, screening and assessment, uh, case management, you'll see the other areas there. Uh, and uh, essentially it helps to promote integrated care. Um, significant investment in CCBHCs. So in July, uh, we announced uh, 100 additional uh, CCB, so Certified Community Behavioral Health Clinics. We now have over 400 of them, just over 400. Um, and you'll see some of the outcomes from intake uh, across a number of areas. We do see improvements over time um, and continue to look at our data to, to be able to better understand the impacts of this model. Um, next slide, please. Um, so, you know, another one of our cross-cutting, uh, this is actually one of our priority areas that we see as cross-cutting as well, um, is, is just looking at our data. You know, we have a lot of data uh, at SAMHSA. And one thing that I'm sort of uh, um, excited about is the ways in which we're planning to use some of our data to better understand um, equity uh, patterns, for example, uh, the ways in which our programs are um, meeting the desired uh, uh, outcomes and intended uh, outcomes. Uh, and really just disaggregating in a number of different ways, regionally, um, again, by key demographics, um, looking at outcomes. And so we have a number of different data sources um, that can help us get at this. So SPARS, um, as you know, is our, uh, grant, our um, data source for discretionary grants. We have the NISDA, um, which we released uh, last week, and we'll be doing a series of NISDA, additional NISDA reports uh, that further disaggregates that data. So. Um, we really see this as, as an area that um, increasingly will be helping us around uh, driving policy and um, funding sort of decisions and planning. So excited about uh, further using our data in, in innovative ways. Um, next slide, please. Um, the other uh, study that we have going on, and again, is this is, is another example, um, is, is our uh, MPDS study. And essentially, this is a study to to better get at the prevalence of mental health uh, disorders uh, such as uh, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, uh, psychotic disorders, uh, to better determine the prevalence 
of different substance use disorders across the population. Um, what's unique about this, this survey is it includes both household and non-household individuals. Um, so the NISDA uh, truly is a household survey. Uh, it does not include individuals that are in institutions or individuals that are in uh, that are homeless. Um, this survey here will include both individuals within households and non-household populations. Um, so that's one that we have uh, that's currently underway. Um, next slide, please. Um, you know what, I'll, I'll go ahead and skip this one. This one was just about, you know, how we use data also as well within our prevention, our strategic prevention planning and thinking. Uh, and so, um, but we'll go to the next slide. Um, we also uh, have developed a number of evidence-based practice guides, which we're continuing to disseminate. Um, a lot of those will review the literature and, and the data within particular areas and then summarize uh, some of the literature. And, and so these are three that we've recently released. Uh, and so those are available on our website as well. Um, next slide, please. You know, workforce, you know, when we talk about forecasting, workforce is, of course, an area that uh, is of significant concern. We hear this um, often when talking with grantees or conversations with states. Uh, and so these are just two examples of workforce related programs uh, that can help with, you know, sort of projections in, in terms of what the workforce looks like. Uh, both numbers and then also demographically. So one example is a minority fellowship program. Uh, and so that, that's a program where we um, help to fund both master's level as well as doctoral uh, level professionals in uh, behavioral health professions to, to uh, increase the diversity uh, there. I'm a minority fellow from uh, 1990 to 92, and, and I can actually 1990 to 93. Uh, and I can say that it was, it absolutely uh, changed the course of my career. Uh, nice thing about th this fellowship program, and we're certainly looking to find creative ways to scale it up, is it, it provides mentoring opportunities. So it's not just sort of uh, investing in, um, you know, an initial period of time uh, for the trainees, but also connecting trainees to other professionals in the field and other professional development opportunities. So excited to continue with that program. Um, and then our technology transfer centers, you know, continuing to offer ongoing uh, training in TA uh, to the behavioral health professionals is important as well. Um, okay, so why don't you, let, next slide, please. I'll just do a couple more and then we'll stop. Let's just, next slide. Um, the last thing I wanna talk about is uh, OBS, our Office of Behavioral Health Equity. Uh, and so again, this is one of our cross-cutting areas. Um, when I was at SAMHSA before, uh, 1990 to 90, or, or excuse me, uh, 2012 to 2014, uh, was, was pleased to be part of the work of OB. And one of the key areas of work here is our disparity impact statement. Um, and that is a uh, area of work where discretionary grantees have to indicate the ways in which the grant is going to address or will address uh, disparity populations that they may be serving. Um, and so uh, we're continuing to implement that and, and are looking for, in fact, ways to expand that to, to other grants in addition to our uh, discretionary grants. Um, and next slide, we'll do, and this will be my last one, and then we can have some uh, discussion. Um, the other, uh, you know, one thing that the uh, grantees have to do as part of the disparity impact statement is they have to indicate how they're going to use the class standards. Um, so the national standards for culturally and, and linguistically appropriate services, um, how they'll use those standards to address and advance health equity within the grant that they're implementing. Um, OMH recently put out the behavioral health implementation guide to the class standards, and we'll, we'll be doing some work with them um, in the coming weeks around helping to disseminate this. Um, but this guide is wonderful. It provides you know, concrete examples um, from a behavioral health perspective about how to implement the class standards. And so um, definitely working to disseminate this across our uh, grantees and across the field as well. Um, so I'll stop there. Uh, so we have time for, for questions and discussion. And, and uh, again, so appreciate the invitation and, and being able to be here with everyone. Well, thank you. And also thank uh, the rest of the speakers too. But I know our Dr. Delphin Rittman just has very short time with us. Um, so I encourage uh, everybody who's listening to submit questions. And while we're waiting for uh, questions, I'm just going to raise uh, an issue for her that's really based on the presentations of the last couple of speakers before her. And I think they identify, you know, I think one of the great things is that we're at a cusp. 
-hmm. and there's a lot of positive stuff. There's stigma reduction. There's all the new programs that uh, you just mentioned. Uh, there is uh, much higher mental health uh, program awareness uh, in the general population. At the same time, you know, the presenters talked a lot about how there's just been this huge loss of resources in behavioral health. I think uh, Ron mentioned the $38 billion loss, that there are issues in terms of data and quality. And I think Neil raised the issue of how government might be able to help in terms of uh, sort of codes, in terms of uh, sort of like licensure, in terms of research and grants. So, you know, I think it seems to me like we've got a lot of stuff going on in terms of programmatic advances, but some of the systemic uh, issues that are going to shape what happens to behavioral health um, are also, it seems to me, critical. And so I thought I'd start that by just asking you in terms of what SAMHSA is doing in terms of those uh, sort of systemic funding interventions in terms of uh, some of the issues related to some of the other areas that I just mentioned. Yeah, no, thank you. Great. I mean, such an important question and, and it, it's right on. I mean, there are many challenges across behavioral health. And, you know, I think one thing I appreciate is that the, the president is truly committed to, um, you know, funding behavioral health uh, services and, uh, and the secretary encouraging sort of bold action. Um, our budget has practically tripled. It is it is way more than it's ever been, um, and so we the substance abuse block grant, uh, actually substance abuse and mental health block grant, um, each received uh, in total about six billion, six point two billion, um, above and beyond, um, you know what it is previously the previous funding levels, and so I think that has really helped. Um, you know, also in terms of the American Rescue Plan resources, I had mentioned uh, the hundred additional. Um, CCBHCs, so Certified Community Behavioral Health Centers, we've been able to fund 100 additional uh, centers across the country. Um, so I think that's another real critical and key investment in behavioral health uh, uh, because the need is there. You know, we're seeing need like we've never, like we've never seen before, certainly over the last, uh, you know, over the last 18 months. And, um, and so those are just a couple examples. You know, the the other thing is the state opioid response grant that that has remained. It is in the pre, in the uh, FY22 budget, um, and so and many of our grant programs have seen increases. So the resource piece is is definitely there. Um, the data piece that's a whole other conversation, but but certainly one that uh, is reflected in our, our prioritizing data is one of our uh, key key areas of work. Well, thank you. Uh, I think the one other area I'm going to take the prerogative and ask a question about is an area I know that you have a lot of expertise in. And I know we, you talked about the Office of Behavioral Health Equity. And um, I, I just uh, think, and it's been a topic of discussion that we had in our previous sessions as well. What, uh, uh, from your perspective, has really worked well in terms of reducing uh, race, ethnicity uh, disparities in behavioral health, and uh, you know, and what's being done to promote the sort of uh, dissemination of those kinds of interventions? Yeah, that's a great question. It, it's a great question because we know that so much has been, you know, put in place. Has been, a, I think, a focus for the for the field for quite a while. Um, sometimes the harder thing to sort of get at is, you know, how does you know, what are the con what are some of the concrete impacts in terms of health equity? Um, because we know, you know, it, it, it's disparities are determined by so many different um, socially determining factors. So, you know, the social determinants of health. And so um, all of these areas often come into play when we're thinking about disparities. You know, one of the, one of the areas that we're focusing on, we call it our Elevate CBOs initiative. And I think this is one area that can make a difference. Um, we really see, and I believe, you know, evidence-based practices are critical, they're important, um, but we also know evidence exists on a spectrum. Um, there is community-defined evidence, which is also important, and there's practice-based evidence, which is also important. Um, and so we have initiative in place now, we call our Elevate CBOs, and the goal of that um, is to really elevate some of the community-based organizations that we know are doing life-changing, impactful work. 
um, and to help those organizations around grant making, around keeping a grant, around evaluation, um, you know, applying for grants. Uh, and so it's a learning collaborative like um, initiative where we're working through the NED, our National Network to Eliminate Disparities, which includes over 2000 community-based organizations. Um, and so now we're doing, uh, you know, webinars and, and doing these sort of learning experiences for community organizations um, to be able to become grantees and then uh, participate in evaluation related exercises. I'm excited about that because we know that uh, it, cr it creates opportunities to potentially expand programs that may not be currently evidence-based practices, but from a practice-based evidence or community-defined evidence perspective, perhaps are. <laughs> uh, and so it allows us to sort of expand that evidence spectrum. So that, that's just one example I think that will impact disparities. Thank you. I'm going to open it up to the other panelists, Ron and Neil, and see if they have any comments or questions before. Oh, yeah. I have a question for Dr. Delman Rittman uh, on the 988 system. I think the 988 system is wonderful. I think it's needed. I think it'll help us with stigma and many, many other things. However, I don't think we're putting enough effort and resources into it. I know SAMHSA is doing everything that the Congress told it to do and more, but I think it's not enough. And simply putting in place the electronic system by July 22nd, 2022, doesn't address, you know, the 6,000 communities that have nobody to answer the phone when somebody comes in with a crisis. We absolutely have to take on the second and third piece of this simultaneously. And I was on an NAS meeting on this a few weeks ago, and I guess I was a little bit shocked that people thought these things could be put up, pulled apart and done in a sequential way that first you do the electronics and then eventually you work on the human resources. I would argue we have to work on all three. And I guess I'm putting a plug in for, you're shaking your head, yes, putting a plug in that you help us advocate for that because it's, it's just so absolutely important here. Yes, Ab absolutely, absolutely. We don't have time for, um, many of these areas do have to be worked on simultaneously. Um, and so, so know that that's on our radar screen. That's, that's absolutely uh, what's being prioritized. And so stay tuned, stay tuned. We, we uh, you know, recognize that there are sort of workforce needs there. Um, and part of uh, having this go live uh, in July, 2022, as you mentioned, Ron, is about having some of these other pieces in place. Um, this, is, this is a major system transformation, uh, but do know that, that there is, uh, laser focus on this across HHS from the secretary on down. Um, and so, uh, so we're going to get there, uh, but stay tuned. It's uh, a lots in process. Excellent. So, Thank you. And, thank you. Yeah. And I'm so sorry. I, I actually need to jump off, but um, thank you so, so much for the invitation and just for all the great work that you're doing with bringing people together for this really important conversations. And, right. and thanks everyone that was on as well. Thank, thank you. Thank you. For All right. Us and thank you for taking the time. We really appreciate your participation. And I think we may have to contact you again to follow up with any questions or answers. That please do. Have. Yes, please do. Okay. All right. Thank you. Take care. Thanks okay. a lot. Bye. Okay. Bye. So um, just uh, for Ron and Neil's benefit, again, I'm uh, uh, sort of, I think Jessica has put out uh, a request for more questions. But, you know, it seems to me that an area that I would have loved uh, Dr. Delphin Rickman to discuss more is maybe uh, the, this whole area that Neil talked about and Ron, you talked about too, and um, Dr. Delphin Rickman just uh, touched on, is that, you know, this whole issue of quality in the field, you know, it's like, how do we know that this intervention is a good intervention? What is it that I know, I know that Neil mentioned that you know we've got to get, go beyond outcomes, but we haven't even got to outcomes. Yes, yeah, <laughs> right. yeah. And so I think that you know I, I think <clears throat> the thing that I feel Sansa has lost is that a lot of the things that Neil was talking about earlier, looking at outcomes, looking at satisfaction looking at the perception of care. All those things were so fundamental to a SAMHSA position. And I'm just wondering what your thoughts are in terms of how 
we not only uh, sort of uh, move that kind of initiative uh, back on, onto the front burner, but almost make it the sort of uh, cornerstone for some of the other areas, whether it's in terms of quality, in terms of funding, in terms of value-based care. I think it seems to me that a lot of the new measures that people have introduced just don't cover those other correct areas. So would love to hear one, your thoughts about this, two, well, what should be done? Yeah. Ron, you wanna take it first or you want me to go? Neil, why don't you go first? And so a couple of thoughts. Interestingly, when several years ago, when we wanted to enter the managed care arena, we said, well, we got, we, you know, there was a pivotal point where we got to collect data because what we're doing, we need something to anchor it to. So we chose to use validated surveys, PHQ-9, GAD-7 and the like. And we actually had a very robust internal discussion, which is these aren't really that good. They're okay and at scale, but they're really a self-report snapshot in time. And the feeling was, was if we came with something more interesting, it would be a factor that no one really know what to do with. So if I went to my present employer or to United and said, hey, I got this great way of evaluating quality, they'd look at me like I was from the moon and say, we're not, we don't know what to do with this. So the truth is, and then how do you get people to fill anything out, which I touched on before. People just don't wanna fill stuff out. To me, where we want, where there's huge opportunity, I, I'm not naming companies, but there are actually three that, that are doing on one arena, just to sort of describe some of the things people are doing that to me are fascinating and can actually move the needle, is where they will, with consent, either tape a session de-identify it, de move the HIPAA from it and evaluate the quality of what's going on. And they use machine learning and it's evidence-based. I've vetted, I've spent some time with two of the three and met with the third to really understand, does this make sense? We're not quite there with an implementation or ready to implement it. But the point that I wanna make is it's passive data collection and Ultimately, whether it's the solo practitioner down the street or a group practice of 20 or even 2,000, asking people and groups to have active data collection, you're, you're not going to, it's too hard to get there. So to me, where we want to get is to work towards a more passive data collection. I'm not really talking about sensors, although that's fine too, mostly because people feel it's intrusive knowing how many steps I took being watched. So people are a lot less willing to do that in time, but ultimately that's fine too. But if we collect passive data and we have a system to interpret it, well then quality becomes something that we don't have to actively work as hard doing, which makes it a reality. To me, when I go and I say, I want you to collect get sevens from your patients, and I'm telling it to a three person practice that just moved electronically and just moved online in 24 hours during the pandemic, as Ron said, they're looking at me like I'm from the moon. Like that's a lot of work. How's that gonna work with our workflow? How are we gonna do this? Even if they had a technology solution to do it, it's digital paperwork instead of real. So to me is finding and hopefully seeing this field emerge we see it in customer service. There are several companies, by the way, that are actually able to monitor customer service calls. When they say this call will be recorded, they may have a system that's not only recording it, but giving the customer service representative insights in how to manage the situation from an emotional standpoint and giving the manager feedback on the customer services person's efficacy. Now that may scare some people, and you know, I don't know how comfortable I am all the time of, of all this, but at the end of the day, the passive data collection, if we feel that we have the right solutions that they're collecting what's important and the outcomes to me become the way forward and how we can actually get to make it easy for people is really the take home. Thanks, Ron. So I guess a couple, I agree with uh, what Neil is saying here, a couple of contextual comments. Um, I, I think 
no one's in charge of outcomes work at the US Department of Health and Human Services. And I can go back to my time there. When I was there, I actually had, it was in the days when you had computer printouts, computer printout on my desk, it was about this thick, that had 2,000 outcome measures in it. There were, two, at that time, 2,000 different outcome measures in the US Department of Health and Human Services. CMS had many. HRSA had some, SAMHSA had some, CDC had some, everybody was doing their own thing. The agencies operated independently, and so they didn't really talk with each other, didn't even measure race in the same way. So I, I think a lot of those problems still persist at the federal level that number one, there's no one in charge, there's no clear plan and strategy going forward of how to move this agenda. And as long as that situation persists, and I guess it doesn't make much difference whether it's Republicans or Democrats who are in office, as long as that situation persists, we're going to be laboring on this issue very hard out in the field. So I think that's the context in which it operates. I saw that when I was in the government. I've seen it since I'm outside the government and so on. Um, so some, some thoughts on how you can move, actually move the agenda, maybe a, a little bit slightly different than what Neil's saying, but it's in the same genre. So I've participated in a number of work groups in the last two or three years on this very issue of how we can move the agenda. And one of the solutions that came up that actually I think has been written up here is that uh, Maybe our focus on outcomes is misplaced in the wrong areas, that what we need to do in looking at outcomes is say, you know, the first question is a, a systemic question. Have we put in place the structures that make an outcome possible? Do we have in place the services? Do we have in place the people who are trained to do these things? You know, if I'm if I'm expecting people to do a particular, I'm expecting them to do cognitive behavioral therapy, I would want to know that they actually had the capacity to do this. So have I set in place a system that will do this? So then rather than go into the system and do, I think what Neil was saying we shouldn't do, doing process measures in the system, are you actually doing this thing as we do cognitive behavioral therapy or how did this impact on you and going downstream and looking at some more global types of outcome measures. For example, one of the very important global types of outcome measures, I think it's absolutely critical for what SAMHSA does is how many people lived or died. So when you get into, and I've done research in this area myself. So when you get into this area, and my research basically showed that people who are served in the public mental health system were literally dying 25 years earlier than other people. That wasn't all because of the care they were receiving. Some of it was. Some of it was due to social determinants, et cetera, et cetera. But if we need to have global measures like that, that we can look at and say, by doing this particular intervention, have I reduced the proportion of people who actually die? Uh, or have I extended life by one year? And uh, there's actually some planning done in the uh, Office of the Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation. What would it take as a financial investment nationally to change the life expectancy of everyone with a behavioral health problem by one year, adding one year of life on average to every single behavioral health client. And I think the, the cost of that was estimated, I don't remember the exact number, uh, but it was, it was significantly high if you're actually gonna do that. So you can actually begin to then, if you use a global measure like that, you can begin attaching dollars to it and you can begin attaching planning to it. Uh, I was actually involved in a, a, a project somewhat like that where we were trying to do that in South Africa a few years ago. So I think global measures uh, that don't involve us doing these day-to-day -day things as part of the process of care, and I think I'm agreeing with Neil on that, I think are very important. Another, another type of global measure I think is very important and I, again, like the whole issue of value-based purchasing, I think healthcare is ahead of behavioral healthcare in this work, 
is the measure of well-being. I was on the Healthy People 2020 committee and we worked, worked, worked trying to get the federal government to actually do some work on measurement of well-being. And there was, there was plenty of developmental work. NIH has a whole system, the PROMISE system, patient reported outcome measurement information system where they've done the psychometrics. They have like 50 different scales. Uh, it's in the public domain. There's no issue of royalties, et cetera, et cetera. But nobody uses any of this stuff, basically. So the question was, how can we get more focus on well-being? And I think SAMHSA has done a lot of work in that area as well, with their eight dimensions of well, physical, mental, social, spiritual, economic, job, housing, and environmental uh, scales is a very important thing. Uh, because, you know, if I provide care to you, but you don't have ultimately have well-being. And that's at the individual level. I could also envision this as something at the population level. Then I have somehow missed the mark in what I'm doing. And it may not be due to the fact that I didn't give the person cognitive behavioral therapy. It may be something simpler. It may be something that uh, the person doesn't have an appropriate place to live. They live in a house that has rats in it, for example or other types of things, other social determinants. So I think there's a lot that can be done in these areas uh, that we actually are probably not doing in as sincere or as an effective a way as we could as a field. But I think I put that partly at the fact that there's a lack of leadership in doing this. And, uh, I think there's actually a lack of innovation in this area within the field, people thinking outside the box of other approaches and so on. Thank you, Ron. Ron, there's a question from uh, one of the participants uh, from actually Michelle Nunemacher. I'm not sure I'm saying that right. And I don't know which state she's from, but the question, and this is based on uh, sort of a response to your presentations and that's, um, how can we really address the issue of the behavioral health workforce, which uh, both of you, I think, identified as an issue? What are some innovative ideas that you all have in terms of moving the needle on that front? Neil, do you want me to start this time and you can follow here? Go for it. You're, you're <laughs> back to follow, but I'll do my best. <laughs> uh, so at, at any rate, so... This is something, this is the tiger I've had by the tail personally for a very long time. So go, literally going back to my days in SAMHSA, in, in the last three or four years I was in SAMHSA, I was in charge of developing, or one of the things I was in charge of was developing a strategic plan for human resources. And so we worked with a number of contractors, we interviewed 5,000 people, we put together a plan and we put it out there. We subsequently convened a national meeting of 500 people to build political support for this plan. And at that time, then I left the federal government. And the plan called for a, a number of essential steps. Number one, we have to create a center on human resources, and it was called for in SAMHSA, that looks at best practices in developing human resource capacity. Very much as Dr. Delman Rittman was talking about uh, practice-based evidence and so on. So there are places out there that are addressing this on a daily basis. We don't know anything about, nor do we compile anything that's going on there. We need to have websites in that, uh, that center and so on. So the first step was the creation of the center. The second step was creation of a large national grant program to train more behavioral health providers. Now, Dr. Delman Richmond talked about the, uh, the minority fellowship program. Yes, that's a very important program, but it trains relatively few people a year. We used to have the, uh, a, a grant program in NIMH and it continued in SAMHSA, which was the clinical training program. We trained 50,000 people through that program. The program ended in 1994. It's never been funded since. One of the things that need, is needed here is a program in the magnitude three to $500 million a year 
to fast start that. So the, the center was never, after I left the government, the center was never created. The grant program was never developed. So as I said in my talk, in those days, it was a problem. Now it's a crisis. It's a crisis because the baby boomers are all retiring and you know they're at the age that a lot of these people who are baby boomers who worked in the field have run community mental health centers for 35 years. They may not want to leave completely, but they don't want to work 80 hours a week anymore. They want to work, come in and volunteer and maybe work one day a week, these types of things. We haven't figured out a way to accommodate the baby boomers as part-time people, number one. Number two, we have far too few people coming into the field on the front end. I look at psychiatry and I always talk to the American Psychiatric Association about this. I say, you are not training enough people because you're not training enough people and too many of your people are leaving at the other end, aging out and dying. You are aging as a discipline. And in the years I was talking to them about this, the average age of a psychiatrist increased from 50 to 59. If you see a psychiatrist today in the United States, the average age of that person is gonna be about 60 years old. There's something wrong with that picture. There are not enough people going into the front end of that discipline. And the same can be said of some of the other disciplines in behavioral health. We need to start at a much earlier level. We need to have people begin talking with people in high school about having careers in behavioral health. We don't do any of that in our field. So there are many, many strategies here that can be implemented. A, 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 a simple one that's already in place that we need to do advocacy for. We need to increase the number of people who are trained through the HRSA program, the National Health Service Corps. Currently, the National Health Service Corps trains about 3,800 behavioral health providers a year. That is just a pittance compared to what we absolutely need. We probably should be training 38,000 a year through that program. The program exists. We need to get funding into that program to train a much larger number of young people. And I guess finally, I'll stop here. Uh, one other thing of the front end people coming in, we don't create career trajectories for people any longer. I guess when I came into mental health and VJ, I'm sure when you came, we had the idea we were gonna be in this field for our career. That, you know, we would start somewhere and we'd probably continue there and so on and so on and so on. People no longer come with that expectation. They come with the expectation, I'm gonna be here for two years and I'm gonna move there for three and on and on and on. They never take hold anywhere and they particularly don't take hold in behavioral health care. So we have tremendous turmoil and turnover among the younger people in the field. So just a few ideas here. Thanks. So first, uh, everything you said is right. And I'll add a couple of things. Um, one, the easy answer is pay people a little more. Um, you know, and at the end of the day, a lot of these community mental health, for the amount of education you have to get in debt, it's not a high paying job. Um, and it's not an easy job. It's a very hard job. I pay people a little more. Um, but that's the easy answer. Um, I agree that you know we, we've had some paucity of training and some failures there in another generation. It's nice to feel young, even if it's only due to some funky math. So now I feel young for a change being under 59 or 60, depending on the psychiatrist. <laughs> the other thing that's interesting to me and where the opportunity lies, and it goes back to what I said about professional groups. There's a unique opportunity for the professional groups to say, we're going to find a way to ensure the clinical efficacy of people who don't necessarily have masters and PhDs and MDs, meaning peers are great. However, Maybe we need to mandate the same way some states have had training and supervision requirements. Having people without degrees, I'm not that comfortable letting everyone loose and do whatever it is that they do because they had an eight week webinar training program. I don't believe that's great education. What I am more comfortable is saying a psychologist can supervise four peers, Here's the supervision paradigm, the APA, 
has developed this in concert or all the groups. And now we can figure out, I'm a psychologist, A, I get a revenue stream that's interesting and helpful for my practice. More importantly, I can now oversee instead of 40 people a week, 100 people a week and the people who I need to spend a lot of time with, I can. But I am now responsible for people who provide some level of care, maybe lighter touch or I step people down. And, and it's not a company that says we're a peer advocacy. It becomes a structured group of people that's not going to take 10 years to build. And, and it's not perfect. There are a lot of details there to kind of get this right. But I do believe that. The third thing is what we touched on with value-based payment, which is simply, it's still a fee-for-service world. Um, I used to get some people come to my practice and they, you're in therapy for three years. Like, What'd you do? I don't really know. You're in therapy for three years. You got to tell me what you did for three years. Well, I spoke. What was your treatment plan? I don't really know. Uh, that's the extreme. But if you extrapolate out is, when someone comes, we don't really aggressively move them through. If they want to keep coming for treatment, they come and we're happy to help them. But we're not incentivized financially, not that the world is pure financial. The system isn't set up to move people through. The system is set up for people that when they're there, they can stay if they want. And I think trying to figure it out, and I'm not talking about utilization review or managed care being the arbiters of this. I'm talking about trying to figure out a way where we want to have a structural way where people spend the least amount of time with the highest professionals, not because they don't benefit from extra care, but because it's a scarce resource. If I wanted to keep going to an orthopedist when I should be with a rehab, the orthopedist won't see me. The psychiatrist might. Yeah, thank you, thanks. Oh, there's another question. And this is from uh, Jan Kosofsky in Louisiana. Um, I, and this is what she says. I, I love the idea of the patient indicating their satisfaction with what was delivered. But none of us uh, do those kinds of surveys. What are some ways to measure if the patient got what they came for? Who wants to take That's it? a really good question. And it's on a lot of levels. Um, and it's fascinating. And there is one interesting thing in mental health, which is sometimes someone comes for something and they shouldn't get it in behavioral health. And what I mean by that is when you show up to someone's office and what you really want me to say is you're right, your mother-in-law is wrong, but that's really not what treatment is. So let's sort of put that aside for a moment and, and speak about therapeutics. Delta Airlines asks me one question. How satisfied was I one to 10? Basic Likert kind of concept. We don't need a lot of data. Yes, we can get very granular, but we don't even have to be. Ultimately, one or two questions about the experience is good enough to serve the purpose. Are you getting what you needed here? And if I'm running a practice group and I have 10 employees, I'm not worried that they got a two from one person. And I'm not worried about the difference between a 6.7 and a seven. But in general theme, that's enough. And to me, it's more meaningful is A, did you achieve what you came for, which might have been reconciling your difference with your wife. Most people don't say, I want to drop four points on my GAD7 score. That's a little tongue in cheek, but because I think that's the concept. We just got to ask one or two questions. And when the next time you purchase something from a company that you think does a good job and they send you a survey, take the survey and steal two of their questions. <laughs> Thanks. Ron? So I, I agree with what Neil's saying here. And just to add one more little factoid to this, there's also a lot of work ongoing again, and BJ will appreciate this, on what's called goal attainment scaling. And goal attainment scaling is simply the idea someone comes in they're asked, you know, why are you here? What, what do you want? What do you want us to do here? That is recorded in some way. And then the care is assessed against the recording of what the goal was that was agreed to at the beginning of the care. And that, again, can be a very straightforward, simple system. There are a number of entities out there that are working on this again. 
And when they first started working on this, I, again, got invited to a technical group to discuss this. And I said, well, you know, you know that this is nothing new. This is something that we worked on literally, you know, 30 and 40 years ago here, that there's a whole literature out there on goal attainment scaling. And it's actually, VJ been part of this conference in many years past where some people came and talked about goal attainment scaling, but it's a very simple system, uh, not a complex system with many, many questions, but a simple system. Why did you come here and how well did we meet the reason you came here, basically? Yeah, and I, you know, I guess in answer to that question, I just wanted to add to what Ron was just saying. Uh, I think uh, almost 20 years ago, um, through the mental health statistical improvement program that was uh, shaped by uh, and actually run by Ron uh, at uh, SAMHSA and at NIMH, uh, there was uh, several instruments that were developed, but as part of the MISIP consumer report card, there was the MISIP consumer survey that was developed that had a couple of satisfaction measures, but the whole idea was also to think of it as a consumer perception of care measure, looking at uh, three domains, looking at uh, perception of care related to access in terms of quality of services and in terms of outcomes achieved. At that time, there was a lot of controversy because a lot of uh, clinicians and providers felt that that alone shouldn't shape the system. And so there was this whole issue of trying to mix uh, clinical measures as well as uh, perception of care measures. But though that, that measure still continues to be used by SAMHSA as part of uh, the con uh, Community uh, Behavioral Health Block Grant Program by all 50 states. And at, you know, in a lot of tests that were actually funded by SAMHSA, some of the psychometric properties of some of the different dimensions were actually very strong and actually stronger than uh, some other measures that Medicaid and others were using. So the measures exist, whether they've received the adequate support, I think is an issue, but I think it's not very hard to move in the direction because they've existed, they've existed for over 20, 25 years and I think part of it is they've never received the support and ballast that I think they need. Um, I um, seeing if there are any more questions, but while I'm looking, I'm just going to uh, sort of ask a, a question of Neil. You know, Neil, you had a lot of experience with uh, digital behavioral health and talk space and so on. But you know, as we talk about um, sort of solutions and outcomes, you know, I think part of what happens is that we start saying, well, does that work for people with serious mental illness? Does that work for people with different substance use issues? So can you talk a little bit about the sort of role of digital behavioral health interventions for different subpopulations, uh, you know, given the different kinds of diagnoses, different kinds of age groups, uh, and talk about what the potential impact uh, of digital behavioral health is for the field as a whole, but also for specific subpopulations. So we've seen a lot of companies spring up in every, in almost every aspect. In substance abuse, there are probably two or three dozen that are purely virtual. Some have some bricks and mortar presence um, and they treat every condition. Less so in some of the more specialized eating disorders, there are two or three, it's a little less emerging, it's a little trickier to treat digitally. And we've seen a suicide company that focuses solely on people with high risk for suicide comp. We're starting to see a lot in adolescents. These are delicate populations, and as opposed to anxiety and depression, especially if it's mild and moderate, we want to put a higher level of scrutiny into what they're doing. 
as the seriousness goes up, the evidence and monitoring you want to see needs to go up also. And that, that, that comes in two fronts. One, you want to see that the company actually has some people who know something clinically that there's some evidence that helped them design the company and that they're tracking and monitoring. Ideally, they have some outcomes internally or they're obtaining them. Second is that this is where the payer space, and, you know, people often say payer, what value do you add? This is a place where there is value because we do have the data, we do partner with multiple companies, and we track this very, very closely from two fronts, a quality front, that's sort of the MD group, and a cost front. And we make decisions based on those two parameters in tandem. So something has to have some efficacy and it has to be cost effective. The greatest solution in the world that has, you know, is just too expensive, isn't gonna get very far, except for a very, very small subset of people. And, you know, I spend a lot of time in some of the doctors who work with me and people spend a lot of time evaluating this. And when we pilot, if it's not something that's pretty well established, we do it small and we watch it very, very closely. And, and that's, I think, part of our job because the goal is, is if it's good, we want to bring it to market as a way for people to get the care. So that's one of the places where I think the system can function relatively efficiently, relatively, if I say relatively, because it's never perfect, but relatively efficient. And when you think about like, where does managed care fit in in the healthcare of the future, to me, it becomes the evaluation of the clinical efficacy of the incoming solutions and the ability to add those to someone's benefit. It sounds a little boring when you, when you sort of say it, but to me, that's a very valuable piece. And, and you know, it's a different debate whether the machine makes sense at all in our healthcare system, but in the current iteration, that becomes a very valuable and important function. And to me, that was a big reason why I went back into managed care is because that to me is what I like to do. And I think that adds a lot of value to the healthcare world. Thank you. Um, I am looking, I don't seem to have any more questions from the field. Um, if there are some, please get those in on the Q&A box. Do you, e e either of you have questions for each other? I've got more questions for you if <laughs> you don't. Shoot, EBJ, go ahead. Well, one of the things that I'm very curious about is that, you know, in several of our past conferences, we really underlined and emphasized the notion of recovery. And I have to say that that is not a word that came up uh, very prominently in any of the presentations about the future. And so I, I, you know, I guess, you know, I, I spent a lot of time sort of working with people on measures of recovery and incorporating recovery into sort of outcomes and evaluations and so on. So, you know, um, it would be good to get your perspective from where you all sit uh, in terms of what's happening to the concept. Uh, so just a, a few comments here. Um, I think there's, uh, so a little bit on the history of this. So the, the recovery concept did not come into the field through research funded by NIMH or through professionals. It came into the field through consumers and peers through their own lived experience of going through this and saying, you know, in order to recover, I had to do X, Y, and Z. And it, it really was a trial and error process. And so that really came, began coming to a head about the year 2000 and then has expanded since then. The Affordable Care Act in its concept of person-centered care supports the concept of recovery and moving the agenda on recovery going forward here. Some of the exciting work that's going on on recovery right now is 
and I think it relates to some of the previous things that we've talked about in this session. What, what is the ecology of recovery in a system? So if I were to look at a community, what are the things I need to have in place in that community, formal, informal, interactional, in order for it to be an ecology that promotes recovery of people in the community. I think that's very exciting work. There is actually some federal funding going into the development of a, I'm gonna call it a, a, a recovery ecology measure so we could have a scale that we could compare all 3,143 counties in the United States on that measure. I think that's very exciting work. The problem with that work, in my view, is that it only in, begins with treatment. It doesn't begin with prevention. And I think a total ecology has to include not just the, the treatment measures, whether they be formal or informal or self-developed or whatever, it also has to include what are the characteristics in that community that prevents you from becoming worse if you do drugs or that prevent you from going into an episode of depression if you have a tendency to become depressed and so on. So I think that's very exciting work. I think it needs to be expanded to include prevention and we'll have to see how that plays out over the next year or two, basically. Neil? Well, I'm only gonna add one small thing, which first of all, that was an astute observation. And you're right. Um, I'm personally, and, and we're more focused on wellness and upfront wellness is a degree of prevention, which is, I think we focused a lot on what happens when people are, get to a point where recovery becomes the most important part of where they're at. Where we haven't focused is, is how do we limit the number of people who need to get to that point? And that's where we've done, first of all, America is terrible at it as a country, right? We don't prevent, we're not a preventative country overall relative to others. We're focused more on waiting till someone has a problem and then we treat the problem as opposed to prevent the problem. And the way you prevent problems is focusing to me on wellness and whether it's getting the gym membership upfront or some reimbursement so you join the gym before you get diabetes or having access to coping or learning some skills before you get sick or, sick or before you get depressed or before at the early onset. That to me is where, not that recovery is not important. I think it's more important because it lightens the load on the whole downstream system. So it's not that it's not important. I would say though, is it my number one on my list? To be very frank, it isn't, but it doesn't make it less important, just not as high up. Thanks. I have another question. This is also, once again, from Jan Kosofsky in Louisiana. And the question is directed to Neil. Neil, if teletherapy is embraced for patients and staff, do you see all therapy moving in this direction are there good reasons other than technical problems with teletherapy that make in-clinic visits necessary? Depends. First is there's a personal preference. And, and I believe in the value of selection bias. I think it's very powerful. So the selection bias is if you wanna to go to an office, you should go to an office and have that ability. That, that's number one. So I don't think we ever wanna to get to a world where we're gonna require people to use any modality that they don't really want. From an efficacy standpoint, the data is pretty clear that at least on the video and is that the outcomes are the same if we feel that we're measuring the right things. And as someone who's done a lot of telehealth really for the last decade, after a while, it feels very second nature and it doesn't matter except, and there is an except. There are people, there are sometimes conditions and there are sometimes just situations where you wanna lay eyes on the person and it becomes helpful. 
there is a debate whether people, for example, with psychosis are appropriate for telehealth. I tend to lean towards, not really, it's not great for them. Can some people who have some psychosis do it, have it? Yeah, but overall the net net is no. I wanna see if we can offer it and make sure everyone is aware that this is an option, have the people who like it choose it, and the way we help our workforce on the ground is open up that access for the people who need or want it to have it. And that becomes the strategy. And where we are now, it's probably gone back to about 40 or 50% telehealth for most people and sort of looking at the data that I look at in my job. And I think that that's a pretty good place to be. I don't think I want it to be 90%. I don't know, should it be 70, 60, 50, 40, you can debate. So I feel like we're getting there. And then I also like the fact that a lot of clinicians are gonna have the ability to do both. So an initial evaluation, it's nice. You know, I do like it sitting in front of the person. I think that there's value there. You can do a pretty good one on telehealth too. However, by the seventh visit, it doesn't really matter to me. Once I know the person, telehealth is actually better. They don't have to leave their house. I don't have to leave my house. I think it's a win for everyone. Thanks. Any more questions? Um, if not, I just uh, want to thank um, both of our speakers that are here. I want to also thank Dr. Miriam Delpin Rittman, who was with us before. I think this has been a very stimulating, wonderful discussion. I think, you know, I think we've seen some of the tendencies of what the future might hold the challenges that we are going to have to overcome. And I think it gives us all a platform on which to take some next steps wherever we are in our worlds uh, within behavioral health. So thank you both uh, very much. And you know, in absentia also thanks to Dr. Delphin Rittman. I have a couple of uh, logistical closing uh, areas that I need to cover. Uh, one of them is, for those with CEUs, the um, code for submitting your CEU evaluation is C19. It sees the letter C, like California, 1919, go away. That was uh, sort of designed by Melanie Norwood, who's on our executive committee and is uh, actually running the CEU program. And then the only other thing I have to say is that when the session is done, there's going to be an evaluation link that shows up on your screen. If you click on it, please answer that. You will also in your email be getting an overall conference evaluation, which is a little longer, but with that evaluation that you get in your email, there are door prizes and the door prizes, there are two door prizes and they're sort of like $50 each gift cards that you will receive. And there's a mechanism by which we can identify the winners. So the um, pool of people that will essentially be eligible are the people who respond to that evaluation. <clears throat> and uh, we will, get a code from you and then draw from the codes that we receive. So once again, thank you everyone. Thanks again for attending all the sessions that you did. And this is really the conclusion of our uh, 2021 National Dialogues on Behavioral Health Conference. I want to thank our sponsors once again. I want to thank all the speakers. I think once again, our uh, executive committee has done and stellar job putting this together and we're going to be getting together in the next few months to just start the, developing the program for 2022. So please, please, please get us your input and your feedback and that will help us design what happens next. Thank you all again. And uh, well, Very I hope good. you have a good holiday season and we look forward to seeing you in 2022. Thanks again, Ron. Thanks again. Thank Okay, take okay. care. Thank you, BJ. And thanks, Jessica, also. Jessica has been stellar in terms of providing the Zoom support for all the sessions.
Thanks, Jessica.